So I am recording today's session as always, and I will provide it to everybody who has registered for today's session. So if we're going through anything and you want to look back on it at a later date, you will have that opportunity. So welcome, obviously, to July's Mosey webinar for the support side of the product. Uh, so today we're going looking at the client configurations and controlling what your users back up. So to get started, just make sure everybody can see my screen. Okay, so first things first, I suppose we'll introduce myself. Uh, for those who haven't attended before, my own name is Niall Fahey. So today's webinar is a part of a monthly series that we run on varying topics that do come up. If you haven't joined the webinar before, what we will tend to do is I will quickly go through a slide presentation. Today's slides will probably take us no more than 10 minutes to discuss some of the, the ideas that we're looking at from a client configuration perspective. And then what we will do is we'll do a walkthrough. I'll show you what I was talking about so you can see it in real time and, and, and compare it to what you would see in, in, in your own environment. And then we'll leave the last kind of 30 minutes opened to Q&A on today's topic. As always, I will look for feedback from yourself, uh, be it about today's topic, about any of the topics you would like to see going forward, and anything as well as in terms of the session, if it could be improved or done differently as well. Any feedback at all that you think is relevant, I would love to hear it. Okay, so first things first, an overview of today's session. What we're going to look at is what is a client configuration? Okay. Um, Basically, what we're going to look at there is, is, is looking at what makes up a client configuration, why it would be useful and why you might use it. And then as well as that, we're going to look at how do you configure uh, your client configuration. So we'll look at those different varying topics. And then we're going to check, check out then in the walkthrough, we're going to look at how it works. OK, so seeing how the actual process works. OK. So. What is a client configuration? So basically what a client configuration is, is a centralized set of rules and file selections that you can make from within our admin console that allows you as an administrator to push that out over your audience. So it's, it's beneficial from an administrator's perspective because you do not have to rely on your end users ensuring that they make the correct selections. Instead, you're controlling what they either select or potentially can select, or maybe you're just guiding them in a certain way. You're offering certain selections or certain areas that they can they can choose for backup. And providing that area, maybe not limiting them, but you can go to the other side of the scale as well. If you're if you if you want to go totally power hungry, you can decide, okay, well I'm locking this down totally. And these are the only the exact things that I want my individual end users to be able to back up. The additional, I'd say, obviously, because that's centralized control, it does make it ease of use for you in terms of administrating the Mosey admin console. And it also allows you to push this client configuration to many. It also, with a client configuration, you can choose if you're using multiple user groups, you can set up ad additional and individualized uh, client configurations for each one of your user groups. So if, for example, you're using your user group, say, to split up your organization across the organizational functions, say you have marketing, sales, support, uh, maybe finance, you can decide that those users in marketing could be able to back up uh, music files and video files because it might be specific to the type of work they're doing. Whereas a sales rep or a support rep would not be able to back up music files or, 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 or video files. So it can, go, it can break down into that granular level of control for each individual type of user group. So moving on. So how do you set it up? As I mentioned, it does happen within the administration console. Okay, so from within the administration console on your left hand side, if you do have it opened at the moment, on the left hand side, you will have an option under the configurations or under the client configurations uh, tab. So you select that option, client configuration, it will open up a new window on the right hand side. And from here, you will be you will see an, an option. You'll see a drop down that will say server or desktop when you click on it. 
So what this means is that you, for each type of user, so if you're a server user or a desktop user, you do need to create a specific uh, client configuration for each user type. So even if I have 10 users within a user group, uh, four of them are server users and six are desktop users, if I only create a client configuration for the desktop users, obviously that will only apply to the desktop users. If I also want to create a similar uh, configuration for the server users, I can do that also, okay? Or maybe I tweak it slightly for, for server users as opposed to desktop users, but all within the one user group, okay? There, inside in the in configuration options, when you open it up, there is a there's a number of tabs across the top. In the top section as well, you will see the uh, general options. Okay, so these will apply to both the Windows and Mac operating systems. And these are kind of the general basic uh, setup rules that you would see when you're configuring it as a user. Below that, then you will see Windows specific options. And these are obviously for those of you who have interacted with both our Windows software and our, our Mac software, the, you would be able to attest to the fact that obviously our Windows software has a lot more configuration options. Okay, so that is why you'd see the, the additional configuration options within the selection. The most important thing and I will mention here is that when you are setting up a client configuration, be sure to assign it to a user group. I've I have dealt uh, I've dealt with it a number of our support representatives have dealt with it with scenarios whereby somebody goes to the trouble of creating a client configuration but they never actually go to the 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 step to actually assign it to the to the user group. So they create it, they do all the work to create the user group and never actually assign it to the user group that their users are in and therefore the client configuration doesn't get applied to those users. So what we're going to do is I say I'm going to go through a live demo and I'll check you I'll check we'll check how it works and um, checking that to make sure that it does work and what we're going to look at when we do that is you know checking uh, from the client configuration what we set up there and then what we see with inside in the window okay so if you just bear with me here I'm going to pull up my admin console just bear with me I don't have it on the screen yet what I am going to pull across is my VM with my Windows machine on it. And that will eventually react <laughs> to my commands. Okay, so I'm still just going to pull up my admin console here. And I know I probably shouldn't be letting you see all my password, but I'm sure you're all good people. You won't take my all my dots. So that's just going to pull up there. And while that is pulling up, I am going to get my account within my admin console. So here we pull up. Put up my status window. Okay, so if you do have a, a a reseller account, an enterprise account, and some pro accounts will have access to user groups. Not all pro accounts will have access to user groups. If you don't have access to, addi to add additional user groups, bear in mind, you still will have access to the default user group. So therefore you can still create a client configuration. So you should see that um, in, your, in your admin console. So I'm just gonna pull across my admin console here now. Okay, so you should have something similar if you if you have if you're following along and what, what I'm doing here. So if you have your admin console opened up, you will notice on the left hand side here, underneath configuration, you'll have the option for client configuration. Okay, you will also have up the top here user group list where you can see what user groups you have. So if you open up your user group list, you see here if you click on the user group. You would have the option in the tab here for client configuration. And from here, as you'll see for desktop and server, you'll have the ability to check if you have the ability to check if, if there's one assigned to your user group already. 
Okay, so if you click, select the drop down, if there's ones available, if you've created ones already, you can assign it from here, but you can also assign it from the client configuration tab. So what we're going to do now is go through the process of creating a client configuration. And sorry, I'm looking over here now. It's just because I have it on my other monitor. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a client configuration and then we're going to apply it to our user group. So first things first, I need to create the name for the, the, the client configuration. So I'm just going to call it webinar because I'm very original, obviously. I select the key type, so a server or desktop. So this is where the first thing is going to happen. I'm going to need to know which users I want to apply it to. So because I have a very bad memory, I'm just going to jump back here to my users in this group and make sure what type of user I have assigned. So I have my user here who is, I believe, it's just coming back to me, that is a server user. Yeah, so it's a server user. So I'm just going to jump back to the client configuration. And obviously that's important because if I went ahead there and created a desktop configuration and went through the whole process, and when we went to check the client in a minute, obviously um, the rule of live um, video would kill me because I would not have seen my changes. So I'm going to change the webinar, select server, and hit next. This will open up the window. If you're following along, you'll also see the a similar similar view as well. Okay, and the first thing you're going to see here is preferences. Okay, so this is what I mentioned a while ago. You have the general options at the very top, and then you have Windows specific options here. The general options here apply to both Windows and Mac. Okay, and the reason we have Windows specific options here, as I mentioned, was that the Windows client itself just has a lot more configuration options within it. Even though it, the Mac client performs just as well as the Windows one, it's just with Windows, there are a lot more options and configuration options that you can make changes to and make selections for. Okay, so first things first, obviously we see there's an, a, a massive list here of various various options that I can select. Um, I'm just gonna highlight some of the, the kind of more common ones that people look to select uh, because I don't wanna go through the entire list of it here and, and, and put you all to sleep on your in your morning. So uh, the first things first, I suppose encryption. If you want to allow the user to change their encryption, you can let them choose themselves, okay? So that's when you go through the configuration, you have the option when you're in the configuration window to change encryption. You can use the Mosey default or you can use personal key. For those of you who are joining from an enterprise perspective, you will also see the option here for corporate key, okay? And the only difference here is just below this, this section here, what you'll have is you'll have the option to use a corporate key and you'll have a, a box there to input the location of your corporate key. So if you do not make any changes here, you're allowing the user to make the selection so they can use default or personal, um, or they can, yeah, so they can use default, which is the Mosey encryption key that we provide, or the personal encryption key is one where the user specifies the information. Now for you reseller or pro customers, you know, you're probably familiar with this in terms of some customers that you sign up will look to use a personal encryption key themselves to, to, to add additional security to their features. Um, the onus then is on that that individual to keep that personal key safe okay um, for those of you in enterprise in the enterprise sphere if you're using the corporate key then that is something that you're most likely forcing upon your users and they do not have the option to switch okay but there was kind of that's a common area that the people might look to here um, the additional option here is install new versions of the the software silently when they're made available so this will allow that if you push a new version of the software that the user, it would actually be flagged with the machine and the user will attempt to install that latest version. Um, additional options are things along the lines of here, this is the common one. So if you want to go totally um, authoritarian and you wanna lock down everything the person does use, these two options are gonna be key for you. Okay, so that's going to be the don't allow the uh, users to add or edit backup sets or don't allow the users to select or deselect files in the file system tab. So if you select the both of those, that's gonna lock down the selection options within the Windows client. So the user's not going to be able to make any other additional selections but those, okay? Then what you have pushed to them. So they're kind of the most common ones there. Um, you'll have additional things like the, if you don't want to show the restore menu, 
um, in the Windows Explorer. If you don't want the user to perform an in-client restore, you can do that. If you want to force them towards making web-based restores, you can select the option to not show the virtual drive in their My Computer option that is here. Um, and so there's, as you can see, there's an additional options there. I'm not going to go through them all, but you see these are the specific options. The one thing I want to note and highlight here before we move on to these additional tabs here is you'll notice that on the left hand side, there is the option for setting and then there's a lock option. OK, so what does this mean? Why do some of the options have a setting option, but they don't have a lock option, whereas some have both a setting and a lock option? OK, so the easiest way to describe this is if we go back down to these do not select options. OK, if I set that as a setting. OK, if I want to set that as a setting to not allow users to add or edit backup sets, obviously what I'm saying there is I want to enforce this rule. So that is why we then don't have a lock option, because we don't want the person to be able to toggle that on or off themselves from within the client. OK. Whereas something along the lines of, let's see. OK, so don't show the um, Mosey Pro virtual drive on my computer. I can select that as a setting, but that also comes up within the client itself when the user installs it. So if I only set it as a setting, I'm allowing the user to decide themselves whether they actually want to see it. And if they do want to see it, they can make that adjustment in the client themselves on an individual basis. If I want to enforce it and I don't want, I do not want the virtual drive to appear on anybody's machine or any of my user's machine, I, I lock the option and it gets forced upon the user and they cannot, they'll see the option within the client, but it'll be grayed out and they won't be able to make the selection or they won't be able to make an edit on that. So that's what the lock option does. You can set something as a setting. It still allows the user at an individual basis to make uh, the choice whether they want to use that option or not. But if you lock it out, what it does is it enforces upon the user. They will see the option, but it's grayed out in their client. OK, the other thing to note here is this um, this option at the top here, this this notification that you get at the top. OK, and this is in relation to existing users. OK, so when you install a, a user and they have a client configuration attached, what happens is when you install, it goes and checks and sees where that user and what user group they're part of. It then pulls down and says, OK, well, this user, hang on, this user uses a client configuration that we've we've created in the admin console. It pulls that client configuration down to the user's machine and it uses the client configuration that has been set out for it. So when you make changes to an existing client configuration, so if you've created an existing client, config client configuration and you want to make some adjustments, you need to lock the options to enforce it to existing users. And that's just what this option tells you here. It's basically saying that any option that you select here after the fact, so if you have, for example, this client configuration is applied to 10 machines currently, and I make a change, any new customers will inherit that change, no problem. But any existing customers, unless I lock out the option, will not receive that, that update. OK, what will happen is those 10 existing customers won't see any of those changes that you make unless you lock the option. Once you lock the option, that will force it down to existing users also, OK? And for any of the options where there's not a lock option, then just selecting the setting will force that also because you're technically locking it because it's a specific attribute that you want to enforce, OK? So you then have the scheduling option. You have the ability here to define the parameters if you want to use automatic backups, if you want to use schedule backups. If you set up the automatic backups, you can define the parameters that you want to do. You can then choose as well to lock individual options. So you don't have to lock all three. You could if you want, but you can do it by the individual aspects for the CPU, the time idle, and how many backups you want to run a day. So if you have users that you want to run at, you want them to run automatic backups 12 times a day, you could do that here, change this to 12 and force it. You then have schedule backup options. Or in the schedule options, you have the option here to change the amount of time before or after a backup that a backup could occur. And then you can force the user to use these scheduling options. OK, so you can make the selection here if you want it automatic. And rather than ticking each individual one, you can force the user. What that will do is that if you force it there, 
it will inf- it will it will say that the user themselves when they log into the client will not be able to switch the scheduled options so they won't be able to go if if you've if you've enforced a scheduled backup they won't be able to themselves choose an automatic backup if you choose an automatic backup they won't be able to change themselves to a scheduled okay Bandwidth throttling can be done here if you want it in the background. Again, you can enable bandwidth throttling. You can choose the speed at which you throttle, and you can choose when the hours of the day that you want to throttle and the days of the week. Some of our customers do throttle. um, Enterprise-level customers, reseller customers even do it, and some pro customers do it as well. Depending on the quality of their network, how many users they have in their environment, and so forth. If you do wish to throttle, Um, The most common one that people will obviously do is office hours. So we generally tend to see 8.30 to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. And then that's the only period at which the backups are throttled. And therefore, before those times and after those times and on the weekends, the user will be able to use the full bandwidth available to be able to upload. Do note that if you are throttling, it will obviously slow the the, the uh, speed at which your data backs up because you're only you're limiting the amount of of of, of connection that they can uh, the, the machine can make. Okay, you can also force the user to use that. So the most important one, I suppose, is these two options here: the Windows and Mac uh, backup sets. You will notice that if you're inside the client, you when you go into the backup sets tab you have the option there to select some backup sets. And these are predefined selections of files that we and Mosey created. And the reason we created them is they're the most common types of files that users will generally tend to select for backup. And therefore we wanted to assign a certain amount of of predefined backup sets and to make the backup experience easier for you, the user. From here, you can see all of our available backup sets. Okay, so from a Windows uh, option, from a Mac option, you can see all the different types of backup sets that we have available. And you have the option then to select it as a setting, or you can force the user to use it. Again, you have those options there. <clears throat> if, let's say, for example, you're using a specific word processing document on in, in your environment, in your organization, you may have a specific type of software that you use, and it produces a specific, a specific type of word processing document, you can actually view what the selections are and you can edit it from here. So if you click on view edit, you'll see the search locations. You could add in additional search locations if you wish. And then you can see here the different document types. Okay, so what are the different document types that we're searching for? So when we say we're searching for, from the backup set perspective, we're searching for all these various document types. If let's say, for example, you use a specific um, process, word processing document, and let's say the extension for just for for, for ease of, of sake, we're saying the extension is dot webinar. All you do is you come in here, go to the end, hit a space, and type in webinar. And what that will do is in your search location on all your users' machines, it's now going to additionally search for this specific word doc, word processing document. If you weren't entering in there, then obviously the user, the end user themselves, would have to do it on an individual basis. Again, this brings it back to the fact that you're able to create centralized rules that are pushed out to all your users. You can add additional rules here, or you can delete existing rules if you no longer need them. When you're finished and you're happy, click Done, and that will save your changes to the backup set. I haven't made any changes here, so I'm just going to hit Cancel. If you wish to as well, you can also create your own custom backup sets. Let's say, for example, the most common one is that I want to exclude specific file types. So I'm going to search my documents and I'm going to add the rule. I'm going to uh, include file type um, MP3, MP4, um, and WM, let's say WMV. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to input the name for the backup set. Okay. Um, what I'm going to select is I'm just going to call it exclude. Okay. Oops. And then what I'm going to do is select this option here. Files matching this backup set will be excluded from backup. Tick that, hit done, and it gets added to my backup set. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock that out. Okay, because I want to enforce that. And that's be the one we're going to check. So we're going to check that one when when we um, when we go down in a minute, and we're going to ensure that that's after after uh, being downloaded. Updated the wrong one. 
Okay, so there we have it. It's it's selected, excluded, and then we're going to make one other change here so that we can see it when we download it. I'm not going to allow users to make any adjustments to the file system tabs. Okay, so there are my options. What I do then is I've I've created it, I'm happy, and I hit save changes. Oops, sorry, apologies. I made it. So I just make save changes. That gets saved. Okay. Now, if I just go back to my user group, select my user group, client configuration. And we can see here, it's assigned here already automatically because I only have currently one user group created. Now, obviously, if I don't want to apply it to the default user group and I want to create a new user group, I change it to the, to none, and and then that'll be fine. But currently, at the moment, because this is the default, and this is, goes to I suppose for you mostly pro for certain mostly pro customers who do not have the ability to add additional user groups, you will always have the default user group. So once you create a, 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 a client configuration, it will be assigned to the default group. For those enterprise and pro and, and reseller customers and pro customers who have access to additional user groups, you can add additional user groups and you can assign you can assign a, a configuration to each each user group that can be entirely different depending, as we said, on things like the role that the person has in the organization, the actual uh, part of the organization they work in, and so forth, depending how you're using your user groups within your organization currently. So I'm going to submit that. And now we're going to check, okay, has this actually come down into my into my actual um, client. So what I'm going to look at here, first things first, is that at the moment it's not going to it's not going to actually happen because I haven't run a backup, so I haven't checked the server for my configuration. So what happens generally in a backup when we're running for when we're running a backup to actually get our client configuration? The backup starts, and um, for those of you who may have joined last month's webinar, um, or, or pre maybe actually, sorry, two months ago when we were talking about the backup process, when the backup starts, it authenticates with our, with our servers, and then it goes to look for any updates to the software or updates to the client configuration. It's at this point, it pulls down those updates to the configuration, but it doesn't apply them to the current backup. It's not until the next backup that the changes are applied. Because obviously, it's not going to interrupt a, a current backup to apply client configuration. So what it'll do is you'll start your backup. Um, you can leave it run fully or generally until you can see the aspect that it's made connection with our servers, at which point, once it's made a, an authenticated connection to our servers, you can actually pause the backup and it should download. But this is going to be relatively quick, as you can see there. Now I open up my settings, which will probably take a, a time or two because this is a virtual machine and it can be a bit slow. So you can see my backup was a bit quicker than actually opening my settings window on this virtual machine. Okay, so now straight away you can see, okay, that one of my settings has been downloaded. Okay, I do no longer have the option to make selections in the file file system tab. I can see selections that have been made, but I don't have the options to make any changes in here because I have this lock option on the files. Okay, in my backup sets tab, I now have my exclusionary backup rule. Okay, there is my backup rule. Anything that matches it is going to get added into it. Again, I have very limited files here, um, so you won't see it. But what you would see is that on the right-hand side here, you would see the specific list of files, but there would be no checkbox next to them or anything like that. I would just see the, fo the files or folders. If there was, let's say, for example, in this instance, I used um, MP3s, MP4s, and WMVs, if I went up into, uh, if I had the, let's say, for example, I had a music uh, backup set, or let's actually, let's scale right back. Let's say if I if I use this to exclude dot .docs, okay? And I was excluding the dot .docs that I found. When I went up into the word processing documents and searched for those files that have dot .doc endings, I would see them here, but they wouldn't have this, this option in the left-hand side to checkbox. Okay, I would be able to see them in that backup set, but because they're excluded somewhere else, I'm not able to make the selection there. So when you create an exclusionary rule in Mosey, it supersedes any other inclusion rule. 
And obviously that's the way you want it to be because you've gone to the trouble of excluding something. It's definitely something you've thought about and therefore we don't want the ability to be able to include it anywhere else. So as we can see there, I created my backup sets. I, I made my client configuration online. I applied it to my, my uh, I applied it to my user or my user group and then I ran my backup and it was downloaded on the actual client configuration was downloaded onto my machine in a matter of seconds. Now going forward on my next backup, these backup set rules and, and the and this client configuration rules will be applied to, to, to my backup. So that is the finish of the presentation and the walkthrough. Um, in terms of client configurations. What I'll do now is I'll leave it open to any questions you may have on this. If I covered something and you were unsure of it or you want me to cover over it again or you'd like me to go back through showing you something or just if you have just a general question uh, around client configurations, I'm open to any questions now. Um, for those of you who don't have any questions and you're happy with the session, um, thank you again for joining and taking the time to join here this morning. I do realize it's, it, it is in your in the middle of your work day or the start of your work day for a lot of you, um, and that can be uh, you know trying at times to get onto something and 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 spend the time there. So I do really appreciate that. And again, we're waiting for any 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 questions as well. I would love to, to receive any feedback that you do have on today's session, any thoughts you have about the session where we could improve it, or anything we do that we could keep doing because it works, or as well as that, any topics that you would like to see. Okay, so, so Tobias has a good question in here. Can we use the forced option to push changes to existing users and then remove it? Yeah, so once it's pushed to the existing user, then it should it shouldn't be an issue if you if you remove that option, um, because it has then been it has been then been pulled down by the, the the user's machine and it will it will see it as a client configuration option. If you make the changes after the fact, it shouldn't, but you know. Why it's it, to be perfectly honest, actually, it's something I've never, I never actually tested myself. But why don't we test it right here, right now? And let's get a one hundred percent answer. So we're going to need to make a couple of changes first, or will we? Let me just think on this. I'm going to pull up my client configuration. I just want to see: Do I have any option that I? Locked. That would, oh, actually, the backup set. Yeah, so the backup set that I, I, I put in place. So I locked that. So, no, that's not a Mac backup set. It's a Windows one. So I unselect this. Hit save change. That would mean that any new user now getting that should should not get the update pulled down or make it forced on them. And now if we just jump back in here, close this out, start the backup. Yeah, I see Kate, you have a question there as well, and I will answer that now. Just give me one second. Uh, okay, so we're going to go to settings. Again, amazing. My backup was faster than my virtual machine to open up the settings. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, um, once you um, push the change and you remove the forced option, as we can see here, it then becomes something that is selectable. So a while ago, although that exclude rule was there, it was locked out. I've now removed the force option and it's it's something that can be selected and deselected. So yeah, so once the backup runs uh, or once the user has pulled out of that forced option, you can make you can obviously then remove that force option and the change that you had made will stay there. I was almost I was 90% certain that was the case, but I suppose it's better to to be 100% right uh, and thank you very much for the question Tobias.
Yeah, okay, so uh, Kate's question, can you tell us a little bit about Mosey? Um, what uh, specifically, is there any, is it Mosey history? Um, is it about the software? Is Can you maybe give me a, a, an idea of what you'd like me to discuss? Um, and I can do my best, if you don't mind. Sorry, I, I just, I don't want to, probably I could go off on, on many different um, areas and I don't want to... Uh, waste your time so if you do have a specific area about mosey um in terms of if, it, if it's the backup process or just history in general in terms of the product yeah so um so uh, mosey has been in business since 2005 so we were initially founded then as a home backup product um fast forward about a year and a half later we started development of a business op opportunity and the admin console that you see today was was born um, and then in about six to six to eight months later in 2007 we were we were we were purchased uh, by EMC um, so at that point we were purchased by EMC we've worked under EMC until until last year when we were acquired by EMC itself was acquired by Dell so we're as old as YouTube in, in that sense. We're about 12 years old um, as a business. And we have, from from a structural point of view, I personally am based in, in our location, here, our support center here in Cork, um, based out, out of, a, of a Dell facility here in Cork in the south of Ireland. We have support teams in Salt Lake City in Utah. And we have, you know, we have other, <clears throat> pardon me, we have sales offices then uh, throughout the, the, the globe, um, whereby we have dedicated sales offices here in, in Ireland, and as well as that in, in Salt Lake City. And then we have sales agents uh, right across the globe that work for Mosey, but they work out of, say, a Dell office. Um, where we wouldn't have a specific uh, Mosey presence. But uh, the from a support perspective, um, having the the support team here in Ireland and the support team in Utah, it allows us to do our 24 seven support um, and not have the unfortunate scenario where somebody has to be up all night um, covering phone calls. So, you know, it's a follow the sun model uh, in that respect. No problem, Kate, you're more than welcome. So if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to drop them into the, the question box. Again, for anybody who is happy with the with the session today and you have to get back to your, your, your day, uh, obviously feel free to do so. Uh, I would like to say again, thank you for, for taking the time out uh, this morning. For some of you, early afternoon for others and maybe anybody over at this side of the woods uh, their afternoon, um, I do appreciate it. Um, we look forward to seeing you again next month, which will be again the last Wednesday of August. If you do, in the meantime, have any questions about today's session, you would have received my email address when you got the registration link um, or the reminder about the today's webinar. Feel free to send me on any questions around today's topic. And if you do have any feedback, I would really appreciate it. You should receive a survey specifically about the webinar um, after the fact. Um, from the software that we use here for, 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 for the webinar. And if you do have any feedback, you, you might uh, pop it in there for me and I really appreciate it. Um, to, so in the hope that I can obviously want to make sure that you're getting the best out of this session uh, once a month and that you know any topics that you want covered, uh, we can cover them for you. So we'll just leave it open there for another few minutes for any questions.
Okay, so it doesn't look like, um, oh, hang on, we do. So Scott, a uh, good question. Um, is there any plans to allow admins to initiate backups from the web portal? So this is something that uh, has come up before and, and, um, and, and, and it's a question that I have received um, and I have seen from other admins. Uh, at this moment in time, there is not a plan in our roadmap uh, to do so. Um, but what I would recommend is that if this is something that you 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 think would benefit you, what we, what I always ask people to do is to go to is to go to our, our community at support.mosey.com, and there's an option there to submit uh, ideas for product improvements, and it does allow us because like I can go back with the request and say, oh, I have had customers asking for this, uh, but unless we can also back it up with actual customers submitting the idea as well, um, sometimes it can you know. Obviously, they want to see a certain amount of people requesting this before they'll 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 put it into development. So what I would ask is, if you haven't, um, I'll just show you where you can go. If you go to support.mosey.com, and within our community, so we have an idea exchange. open up so if you want to pop in here you can submit an idea or if you see if you want to search for your idea to see if somebody else has suggested it you can do that but if you just want to just put in a new idea um, here you can submit that as well but it is it is something that I do know a certain few other admins have asked me about um, and it is something I think would be would be um, useful. Thank you very much, Scott. Glad we could get that answer for you. Yeah, so a great suggestion there, Gary. Um, so a potential future topic we may we may look at if if you if you guys wish is utilizing reports and alerts. How that can benefit for you as an admin uh, to keep on top of your account. Um, so yeah, so um, why don't we put that in for next month? Sorry, I'm just scribbling here. <laughs> or attempting to rather, seem as my pen won't work. <laughs> oh, there we go. So yeah, so let's look at that topic next month in terms of reporting. Um, how you can use that from within the administration console um, and alerts and how that works also. and. We'll also look, uh, I might touch on as well, some of our, our, our proactive support um, items as well in that session. So for those um, not aware, there, so on those three areas, um, we do obviously have reporting available for you from within the administration console. There's about, I think, six, six reports. They're predefined reports, but you can adjust um, some of the parameters within the report from the admin console. Um, you can sign up for alerts. And then the additional one then is proactive support. So proactive support is whereby the support reps here, if an issue pops up on your account, um, on a user on your account, um, and what we do is we run Yes, it reports on our back end every once, um, every few days, and or every day rather. And de depending on the parameters, we then will open a proactive case. Let's just say, for example, we see an, a machine on your account hasn't run a backup in 10 days. Uh, we notice that there's no case after being opened on that machine. What we'll do is we proactively open a case. So I'll talk a bit to that as well um, in more depth in, in next month's session. But thank you for the suggestion, Carrie. So uh, if there are any more questions, again, feel free to just drop them in there. If not, um, again, just thank you for your time. I, I really appreciate it. No problem, Gary, my pleasure. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be any more questions. Uh, we'll leave that there for today and I'll 
think I have 15 minutes to give you back. Um, again, thank you for your time. If you do think of any questions after today, feel free to reach out uh, to me um, with any questions related to today's topic. And we hope to see you next month. And I will be also sending on the recording of this month's session once we have it hosted on our support website. Okay, thank you very much for your time and have a great day.